Um, well, welcome. Whatever, whatever reason you're here, glad you're here. I'm Olivia, one of the pastors. We have been on an amazing journey as a church since March. We started in the book of Exodus and Joshua, and these stories have been amazing. There have been powerful moments along the way. Pastor Nate and I, we work together to figure out uh, what the church is going to study. We pray and discern and plan, and let me tell you, it's like my favorite part of my job. I get to be paid to read the Bible. It's a dream come true. It's so cool. Uh, and when we landed on Exodus, I was very excited that we were going to dive into these Old Testament stories. But little did I know that God was taking all of us on a journey very similar to Exodus, uh, very similar to what the Israelites what happened in Joshua. Uh, we are on a very similar journey. Now, I don't mean we were in captivity a few months ago and now we're set free. Let me explain what I mean by that. Just as the leadership changed from Moses to Joshua, we are in a new season of leadership change from Moses to Nate, I mean, Mike to Nate. Uh, just as God was leading uh, the people into a new season with a new generation, so God is raising up a new generation of leaders uh, to take on the church, to take it forward. And I promise you, I'm not a teenager. I am closer to 30 than 20, okay? I promise you that. Uh, but we have young leaders rising up uh, to lead this new church chapter of North Church, and just as God placed his anointing on Joshua to lead the people effectively and faithfully, so God has placed his anointing on our lead pastor, Nate Mead. And as we have journeyed through these books, uh, it has clicked for me. I sit in the back with the prayer team most uh, Sundays, and I just have my journal. I'm just writing so many things. So I'm like, oh, we're, we're like that. We're like this. God is doing so many cool things, just like he did with the Israelites. And I'm just like, ah, oh, we are similar to the Israelites. God was doing something new with them, and he is doing something new with us and our church community. And a huge thing on Pastor Nate's heart is he wants our church to be dependent on God from top to bottom, like everybody. We are just dependent on God in every way. And I think as we have been writing our prayers, writing our battles on these papers for the past five weeks, I think we're showing that. We're saying, God, we are dependent on you. We can't fight our battles alone. We need you. And there are so many things on here that break my heart, truthfully. I'm, it's interesting to see everything people are going through. And thank you for being honest and pouring your heart out on these, because we have been praying for them for weeks, and we are hoping that you have seen God's presence work within your battles. And you might be wondering what this is. This is a piece of art that we're going to hang up in the church. And I want it to be a memorial for this season in our church. Because um, just you remember in Joshua 4 where they parted the Jordan River and they walked through just as the previous generation walked through the Red Sea. Um, they took 12 stones from the river and they set it up to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And they did that to remind them of God's faithfulness. And I put 22 stones on this. And I want it to remind us of 2022. So every time we look at it, we remember this is the year of transition where God moved in fresh, new, and powerful ways. And I also want all of you to sign it, not the front, don't mess up the art, uh, the, the back. There's stickers over there. You write your name on it. We'll stick it on the back. The staff already has their names on it. Um, and it'll be available in the lobby for a few weeks. So if you don't get to it today, don't worry about it. It'll be there. But really, if you call North Church your home, we want this to be a memorial for this season. And when you sign it, you are uh, recognizing God is with us and we are thankful for him. His spirit is among us. Amen. Now to Joshua. Where do we find ourselves? We find ourselves at the end of Joshua. This is the final week. I know you're sad. It's been an amazing journey. Uh, the Israelites trusted and followed Joshua, their new leader. As I said, they crossed the Jordan River. They experienced victories in the battle. They came to a place of repentance and rededication. If you remember when Achan sinned and they all had to repent. Um, and we did that as a church as well. We were in repentance. And they saw God's power at work as the God who fights for them. They defeated their enemies. They drove out wicked nations. And now it's finally time to get the land that God promised them. 
God fulfilled his promise. Now, when they got to the land, right, they're probably all hot and sweaty from, you know, winning the battles, and now they got the land, but it wasn't just a free-for-all. People couldn't just run across and be like, okay, quickest runner gets that area and this area, or I want that hill country over there, or I want this. No, God was intentional and strategic about where he placed each tribe, and he, it was kind of their final task to listen to him in that. Like they listened and obeyed him all the way through, and now they're like, okay, no, I still want you to obey me where I'm going to place you all within it. So we find that in chapters 13 through 21. And as a church, we're reading through Joshua together, and you'll find in week six of the reading plan, it's all kind of clumped together, chapter 13 through 21, because it's all the story of they got the land and then God divided it up in a specific way. So please don't skip that part of the reading. It could be easy to be like, oh, there's all these names and confusing things. Like, I'm not going to read that. Please read it. It is so important, so significant, and dive into it with a really good study Bible because you can learn so much about it. And as you uh, dive into those chapters, just remember, it reveals a few things. One is that God keeps his promises. He made the promise hundreds of years earlier to Abraham in Genesis 12 and said, I'm going to make your nation great. There will be more descendants than stars in the sky, uh, sand on the seashore, and you're going to get this land. And he fulfilled his promise to them. God was also intentional. We're going to look at the map in a second about how he placed everybody. And then all of Israel was unified and at peace during this time, which is very special because there was much division to come, but this was a time of peace. This is also significant because it's wrapped, this moment is wrapped in covenant. God is a covenant God, which means he makes agreements. Uh, He made an agreement with the Israelites that said, uh, I will give you this great land to enjoy. You're going to flourish. It's going to be amazing. But here's one condition. You have to remain faithful to me. You can't serve other gods. And if you do, we see in Deuteronomy 28, that's a great chapter to read of just What is this covenant? What is this agreement? What is God going to do if you don't uh, obey? And it makes me think of uh, God kind of like a mom, right? Like, I brought you into this land, and I can take you out, right? It's kind of what he says. So let me show you the map. This is um, the 12 tribes and how they settled during the time of Joshua. And there are changes uh, throughout biblical history, but this is this time. And fun fact, uh, the tribe of Levi, you will not see them on there, even though they're one of the 12 tribes. Uh, And it says because the Lord is their inheritance. They don't have a spot there. They had different towns um, among them. So each tribe had a specific uh, purpose and calling and placement for a reason. So dive into that. Study that, uh, everybody. So once they settled... Joshua wanted to remind them that their work was not done. Yes, uh, they won the physical battles, but there were spiritual battles still ahead. Yes, God brought them here on foot, but he wanted to bring them even further in their hearts. And we find ourselves in chapter 23. Verse 1 says this, After a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua By then, a very old man summoned all of Israel. So imagine this moment. They had rest from their enemies. They were victorious. Things were going well. They were feeling good. And Joshua wanted to make sure he's going to take this opportunity uh, to remind them of who they are and whose they are, that it was God who fought for them. Just as Isaiah 26 says, Lord, you establish peace for us, All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. He doesn't want them to forget that. Uh, A few weeks ago, I met someone new uh, here, and we exchanged names, and she asked me a very simple question, but it stumped me for some reason. Uh, She said, how did you get here? And I was like, how do I answer that question? What do you mean by here? Do you mean how did I get here to North Church six years ago? How did I get here as a pastor? How did I get here this morning with my baby holding onto my leg and I'm trying to you know, run out the door and give him to my husband? Like, what do you mean here? How did I get here? And I just answered, I kind of fumbled over my words and answered her, but I reflected on that later. And I think no matter how I answered the question, how I got here was God. 
If I think of how I got to North Church, how I got to be a pastor, how I uh, got here this morning, how I woke up this morning, I'm still breathing. It's all God. And I think Joshua was calling the Israelites to reflect on a similar question. How did you get here? You must not forget it was the Lord. And we're going to go through uh, the whole farewell address that Joshua has. He says a lot of things, but I think it could be boiled down to a simple word, and that word is look. He says, look up, look down, look back, look forward, and look within. Look up because God is the one who did all of this. Look down at where your feet are planted. God is the one who brought you this far. Look back and remember how far he brought you and look forward to the new places of faith that God wants to take you and look within. Are you ready to commit everything to him, your heart, mind, soul, and spirit? And look at today. Who will you serve today? Joshua calls the Israelites to reflect on all of this in chapters 13, or 23 to 24. And as Christians, I believe we need to reflect on those questions as well. We didn't end up in this room by mistake. God's hand has been at work, and he has been pursuing each and every one of you. He's been leading and guiding and working even when you can't see it. You are not here by mistake. Do you believe it? Uh, God has been guiding you this whole time to be here for a purpose, and he's not done with you yet. I imagine the Israelites, they didn't just magically appear in the promised land and go, oh, we're, we're here now. No, God was with them every step of the way, and he is with you every step of the way. And Joshua calls them to remember who they are, and God asks us to remember who we are as well, but not based on what the world defines us as, or the media, or your socioeconomic status, but defined by him. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God, and if that doesn't wake you up, I don't know what does. I need you to nod something, smile. That is amazing. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. He has brought you through every battle. He is still fighting your battles, and he doesn't want you to forget that, that he is faithful within it all, and he wants you to believe that he will continue to walk with you. And Joshua says, remember the battles, remember the struggles, remember the miracles, but most of all, remember who you are and that you belong to God. There may be some of you in here that have been praying for a long time, and your prayers are still on here, and they haven't been answered yet, and you are wondering, God, where are you? Why aren't you coming to my rescue? And God wants you to know that in the confusion and sorrow and pain and the waiting that he has not forgotten about you, and he is holding you in the palm of his hands. And let me tell you kind of a spiritual secret that when you are in a place of doubt and confusion, that is the perfect time for the evil one to attack you. That is the perfect time in darkness when he's like, oh yeah, let me feed you lies. Do not fall for it because his lies will say, oh yeah, you're not enough. You're insignificant. God is not listening to you. God's not moving. God's not with you. God doesn't even like you. Why are you? don't just stop? Stop praying. Stop trying. Stop going to church. You will always be stuck. You will always be an addict. You will always be unemployed. You will always be in darkness. Your life is meaningless. Do not believe it. As I've read so many powerful uh, prayer requests and battles that are here, and I believe there's going to be a lot more that needs to come other than six weeks of just uh, waiting on God, but God is working things out, and he is with you. Maybe your answer will come next year or in 10 years or when you're in heaven. I don't know, but you need to know that the enemy wants to attack you while you're waiting, and Ephesians 6 says when we put the armor of God in, which is faith, the word of God, all of that, that when we put it on, then what does he tell us to do? He tells us to stand. Stand firm. When the flaming arrows are being thrown at you, when you're struggling to stand even, you need to invite other people to hold you up and to help you stand as well. And we must remember that the victory belongs to the Lord. 
So we need to rest in that as his children, to rest and rejoice. And you know, you need to know deep within your heart and your spirit and your soul that you are going to make it. You are more than going to make it because you are victorious in Christ. And you need to believe that, receive it, and walk in it because the battle is already won. Is that getting through to anybody this morning? Anybody. I can't feel like I'm in a room by myself. I need to feel like you're with me. This is like a partnership here, okay? Chapter 23, it says, After a long time had passed, and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies, just like we read, around them, Joshua by then, a very old man, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, officials, and said to them, I am very old. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all the nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. He's addressing the leaders first. He first talks to the leaders, and then he talks to the rest of the people. And I think that says something about the responsibility of leaders. Leaders are called to point people back to the goal. Uh, and when they feel lost or unfocused or uninspired, and leadership is just influence. So if you have influence over anybody, you're a leader. Moms and dads, you're leaders. Uh, you don't need an official title, uh, but if you have influence, that is what leadership is. And a leader, in God's eyes, is meant to point people back to him. Verse 4 of chapter 23, he goes on to talk to the leaders and says, Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the west. The Lord, your God himself, will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you, and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. And then verse 9, uh, I believe he's saying, look up where your help com comes from, the Lord. He says, the Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord, your God, fights for you just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. He says the same things again and again. I think that's trying to get people's attention that the Lord is the one that is fighting for you. He says it later in this passage again and again. He keeps saying, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. And I believe he's saying that to remind them that there is no doubt, there should be no doubt that it's the Lord that's at work. He goes on to say, the Lord promises to go with you as long as you remain faithful to him. The Lord gave you this land. You did not acquire it yourself. The Lord made a covenant with you. The Lord is crazy about you because he is a jealous and holy God. His anger burns against unfaithfulness. The Lord drove you out, uh, drove out the powerful nations in his power. The Lord fought for you by his might. The Lord made promises that never failed by his mercy. And then he says, are you ready to serve the Lord? Are you ready to commit to him? Leaders, I'm talking to you. And then he gathers everybody. He gathers all the people. 24, chapter 24, verse 1, it says, Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Shechem uh, was kind of known as Joshua's capital because that's where he settled in the hills of Ephraim. So everybody came around him there. And so to the leaders, he was saying, you know, look down where your feet are, look up to God where your help comes from. And now he addressed everybody else and was saying, look back and look forward uh, and look within. And essentially, I'm going to paraphrase this part, that he's reminding them of where they came from. Um, from the beginning, 
in saying God is the one that called Abraham to start this nation. God is the one who called you out of Egypt. God is the one that brought you out of the wilderness. And God is the one that turned uh, bless curses into blessings. They didn't even know they were in danger. There's this story in Numbers 22 where there was someone in the hills trying to put curses on them, and they were unaware of this happening. And then God turned the curses into blessings, um, and he was protecting them from a distance. And he reminded them, God is the one that brought you through the battles. Verse 14, he brings it back to today. He says, now, now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to say it again. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And I think he's asking, who will you serve? He knew that their temptations was other gods and idols. And I just think that is so crazy. How could they see God in his glory, in his majesty, in his might, and still be tempted by things that are less than God? It's like a clear answer to me. Do you want to choose the glorious one true God of Israel or something less? And I think it's a similar question of like, do you want a million dollars or do you want a penny? Please don't choose the penny. Come on. And he knows they use, they use, they pick the penny often. But they're showing God is greater than that. He's asking them, who will you serve? And I want to ask you the same question this morning. Who do you serve? Who do you serve? I'm not asking you, do you serve? Do you volunteer sometimes? No, I'm asking every moment of every day of your life, from when you wake up to when you go to bed, who do you serve? And serving God is simple. Um, I think as Christians, especially myself, I like to overcomplicate things, overthink things, and be like, I don't know if I'm in God's will. I don't know if I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. But God is so simple in saying, all you need to do to serve me is put me first. Seek me first. Depend on me. Spend time with me. Talk to me. Don't act like you are the pilot of your life. I am the pilot. And anytime you try to do that, you're not putting me there. And to seek his face. Practically, this looks like being unashamed of him as well, being unashamed of Jesus and the gospel wherever you go, if that's in, at work or during your lunch break with people in the locker room, at school, whatever it is being unashamed of Jesus. I'm like, yeah, I follow him. I love him. He's my Lord and Savior. Not my Bible boyfriend. Don't say that. He's my Lord. Um, and also it's listening to his voice and doing what he says, um, which is easy as well. But okay, it's easy, but difficult. Like I, I've been recently just being like, God, my whole day is yours. Everything is yours. Let, let, let me just walk with you throughout the day. And um, I've learned that when I do that and I say that, then um, my schedule isn't mine. He changes what I'm going to do, where I'm going to go, who I'm going to talk to. And that's difficult for me because I like routine. I like predictability. I like to know when and where. And then it's been cool. At the end of the day, oftentimes, I'm like, oh, that's not at all what my, I planned my day to be. But that's what God guided me to do today. And I'm satisfied in that. So seeking him. Every day, first in the day, putting him first, that w that's what it means to serve him. Um, but it's really easy for us to serve ourselves instead of serving God. Uh, and it's easy to view volunteering as well as kind of that check mark of like, great, I gave an hour or two of my time to whatever cause, now I get to be selfish for the rest of the week. Yes. That's not how it works. Uh, in the Bible, serving and worshiping are synonymous. So as uh, Joshua says, who will you serve? He's also saying, who do you worship? Who does your household worship? Do your household worship uh, sports or comfort or money or alcohol or a political party or things that make you feel good? Is that what your household serves? 
Uh, it's easy to find that out because it's whatever is at the center of your home, the center of your conversations and your priorities and your calendar and your checkbook. That is what will reveal what you care about the most. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Or how about this? If someone didn't know you and they observed your life, what would they say? Better yet, if someone observed your social media account and observed that, what would they say? If they're looking at your TikTok, your Instagrams, your Facebook, all the things, what would they say? Would they say, oh, it is so clear this person follows God? Or would they say, oh, I had no idea that this person was a Christian? Your life shows who you truly serve and who you truly worship. And Joshua says, we, my household, will serve the Lord. And I earnestly pray and hope that you will do the same. And they responded in verse 16. They said, far be it from us to forsake the Lord, to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who live in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Imagine this moment of just passion and enthusiasm and commitment. It's like that summer camp high moment where everyone's like, yeah, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Everyone's going crazy. And Joshua's like, I don't know about that. He kind of uh, uh, toys with them a little bit in the next verse and he says, I don't know. Are you sure you're able to serve God? He's a jealous and holy God. Are you ready to give him everything? And they say in verse 21, no, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua says, fine. You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel, the one true God. In other words, he's saying, if you are serious, put your money where your mouth is, honey. Throw away anything that can hinder you. It reminds me of Hebrews 12 that says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. In other words, uh, in other translations, the author and perfecter of our faith. So what hinders you? What is the sin in your life that so easily entangles that God wants you to run from? Throw it out. Get rid of it. Whatever it is. I recently talked to someone dabbling in witchcraft, and I was like, run for the hills. That is not okay. That is evil. The Bible says, cling to God and flee from evil. That is not okay. And if it's something you struggle with that's less tangible uh, and more of a temptation you have, then you need to get accountability and mentorship right away. God's serious. He is a holy and jealous God, and he asks us to serve him with everything within us, our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We can't say, okay, God, I'm going to serve you with my heart and mind, but I'm not going to serve you with this area over here. He wants all of you, every part of who you are. And then verse 24, the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. So this is a mountaintop moment, right? They're excited. They're all like, they just got their land. It's like everything's going really well. And I think it's really uh, easy to commit to God and make promises to God during mountaintop moments when you're on the mountain. What's difficult is when you walk off the mountain. And when you go back to the temptations and spiritual battles that await you. And God wants you to know that he is with you both on those mountaintop moments. Those are real moments. But also he's with you in the darkest valleys. When you feel like uh, you can't, you don't feel him anymore. He's still with you. Verse 25 says, On that day Joshua made a covenant for the people. 
And there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone, there's a theme of stones here, and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. So he's saying, look at this memorial. This is to remind us of what you guys just said, what you committed to. Look back at this when you struggle. And then he says in verse 27, See, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. You know what's really cool about verse 27? This is so awesome. It says, See, which is the Hebrew word hene, which also means uh, behold or look. So before I was even studying the passage, I'm like, God, what am I going to talk about? I'm doing the last sermon in Joshua, and he just gave me the word look. Uh, and before I even saw what the passage said, so I just got goosebumps when verse 27, then Joshua says, look. That's the last thing he says to them. It's like, God's so cool. Oh my gosh. Verse 28, then Joshua dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance. And essentially saying, now go and live it out in your families, in your clans, in your homes. You said you're going to serve God, now go and do it. And you may have overcome the physical battles. You must remember, there are spiritual battles that await you. You conquered the land, but now God asks you to be conquerors in the spirit and to teach your families, teach your households how to do that as well, through the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I imagine Joshua at this moment with the Israelites walking away, seeing everybody go to their own homes, and there was peace and quiet. And I imagine Joshua just smiling, maybe shedding a tear, just being deeply pleased with himself, knowing that he fulfilled the promise, he fulfilled the purpose that God had for him. It makes me think of 2 Timothy that says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And he was so excited to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. And then he rested, he died in the land that he inherited God longs for his people to serve him with everything within them and remember his faithfulness. So what about you? I'm going to ask you the question that someone asked me a few weeks ago. How did you get here? Look all around. Look up, look down, look back, look forward, within and today. Look up to remember God is where our help comes from. Look down to see where your feet are planted, where God has brought you. Look back to remember where God brought you from, the battles that he helped you overcome, how far you have walked with him. And look forward to the future. Do you look to the future with dread and hopelessness? Or do you look to the future with hope, knowing that Jesus is going to walk with you to the future as well? And look within. He's asking them, are you sure? Are you ready to commit to the one true God? And look at now. Look at today. Who will you serve? Because God, God wants, he wants every fiber of our being to be given to him as a living sacrifice, as Romans 12 says. It says, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Once again, we can overcomplicate things. Like, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? I don't know what that is. Am I doing it now? Or am I doing it now? All he says is to seek him first. Put him first. Serve him with everything that is within you. That is what God wants from us all. And let me promise you, friends, when you do that, you will come truly alive in Jesus. You may have faith in him, but he wants you to know what it means to walk with him every moment of the day because there's an adventure in store for you every single day. If you don't feel like your life is exciting, then I don't know if you're really walking with Jesus because he has us on adventures with him and he wants us to go from glory to glory and to new places in our faith, okay? And, oh, I'm so excited I lost my place. Thank you, God. Um, you know, okay, so God wants that, living sacrifice. But you know what he doesn't want? He doesn't want your story to end in the wandering. Some of the Israelites, they wandered in the wilderness 
They were lost. They were confused. Some of them died there. Some of them never saw the promises of God fulfilled. They never saw the promised land. And I believe God grieved that broke his heart, that his people, they let other stuff get in the way of something greater, that God's greater plan that he had for them. And what really confuses me about that is how, how were they lost? God was literally with them. He was literally in front of them. How can you be with God and still lost? How many of you are here today and you still feel lost? You are in the house of God and you feel lost and confused. I want to remind you that once you were lost, but now you are found in Jesus. And if you still feel lost, it's a lie of the evil one because you are found. You are not lost. And a greater inheritance is still to come. All of this that, is, that we've read in Exodus and Joshua, all of this is a foreshadow of something even greater because our inheritance, the one that we all get, is Jesus. And the eternal life we find in him, freedom we find in him, hope we find in him, glory, God's presence that is here on earth. We don't have to wait to go to heaven to experience God's presence. We can experience it here and now. And I hope since you've walked through this door that you have felt God's presence with you because he is among us, friends. He is with us. You can feel his presence now. And our promised land, the one that God promises us, is heaven. Our treasure is salvation. It's not just reserved for the Israelites in the Bible and the stories. No, our inheritance is for all people. Those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith is shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last day. Christ is in you. Christ is for you. Christ is with you. And Jesus is Lord over the earth, over the universe, and over our church. Amen? Amen. And God is doing an amazing work in our church. He is working and moving, and we are seeing miracles. We are seeing people say yes to Jesus. And I want to share a story with you. Actually, no, I'm going to have someone else share their story with you. I'm excited about it. So come on up here, uh, Tammy and Paul. Yeah, give them, give them, it's a lot of courage to come up here. So they are a part of our church, and um, we baptized them an hour ago, which is super exciting. Um, yeah, that's it's something to clap for. Super exciting. Um, and we just want to hear a little bit of their story of uh, the battles they've been through, going from darkness to light, how God has really changed their lives here at North Church. So I'll give it away to you. Hi, I'm Tammy. And this is Paul. <laughs> Okay, um, this is kind of my story. Um, growing up, I had a lot of alcoholism, drug abuse, domestic violence, um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, incest. Um, mind you, I was very dysfunctional. Um, the first time that I saw a miracle um, was when I was eight years old. Um, my mother's boyfriend kidnapped us. Uh, they had taken my mother to uh, an alcohol treatment center. And um, he came and said that he was supposed to take us home. Um, anywho, he, we had, um, gone about a mile down the road and, um, 
realized something was out of the ordinary. And so me, my little sister and brother, prayed to God that he would protect us. And uh, we ran out of gas. Um, he ended up getting hurt in the process and having to go to the hospital. And we were taken back to our mother. Um, we found out later that this guy was, um, had escaped from prison and that he was in prison for murder. So um, that was definitely a miracle. <laughs> um, <clears throat> as I was growing up, I had learned to abuse alcohol and drugs. I also was very promiscuous. And it wasn't about sex. It was about I wanted love. I wanted somebody to love me. I wanted connection. Um, at age 17, I became pregnant with my oldest daughter. Um, I was unmarried. Um, at age 21, I got married for the first time. I was in a very abusive situation, uh, a lot of emotional abuse, and um, I didn't realize that I was a victim of DV. Um, uh, I had two boys from this marriage, two beautiful boys. Um, after 13 years of marriage, which I felt that it was my duty, being married, to stay with this guy who abused me, it was better off for the kids to be raised in a two-parent family. Um, I learned after I finally left him, because I was very suicidal, that it was quite the opposite. When I left him, my children were happy. Um, yes. <laughs> Anywho, um, I also at the time after I left him became homeless. I, for probably about eight months, um, I lived in Ogden Hall. Mm -hmm. I also lived in a DV shelter and in St. Margaret's. Um, after I left him, I also went back into more alcohol abuse, using drugs, um, sexual promiscuity. Um, then I met my husband, Paul. <laughs> um, <laughs> we he's met. A good guy. That's so, he's a good guy. <laughs> we met in a bar. Um, that's not exactly where I'd recommend people to meet their spouses, but God knew that I needed him. And I truly believe that God sent him to save my life. Mm. Um, and then once again, more alcohol, more drug use. <clears throat> um, I learned to stuff my pain with drugs and alcohol. Um, I lost my little brother in 2007. He was involved in drinking and driving and was killed in a truck accident. Nine months later, my little sister died from drinking herself to death. 2012... I lost my son to a vehicle accident. Uh, three years ago, my granddaughter was kidnapped by her family. We got her back just recently, a few months ago. 2021, no, this year, <laughs> I lost my mom in March. Um, I've been praying for my family to come to Christ. 
And I think one miracle was definitely noticed today, my husband. Um, uh, last year, I had a couple of hospital visits, and um, I was finally able to admit to doctors that I had a drinking problem. Um, I had severe high blood pressure from alcohol. Um, I had been praying and praying for God to deliver me from myself. Um, I've been coming to North Church on and off for about 10 years since my son died. And Olivia actually got my husband and I hooked up to Rooted, which is an amazing, amazing Bible study. Um, and my husband went because I went. <laughs> uh, a few chapters into Rooted, I went into outpatient treatment. Thanks to my therapist who told me that I could, that she could not see me anymore if I did not seek treatment. Um, I was then unable to go to Rooted because my schedule became very busy. And my husband wasn't so sure that he would be able to go without me. But with a lot of encouragement from Nathaniel, he started his journey. And I continued my journey. Um, we both surrendered to Christ, knowing that we could not fight Satan and sin on our own. Um, my husband is a completely different person now. It's like I'm cheating on my husband with my husband. <laughs> um, it's like God has pulled us up out of the darkness into brilliant sunlight with new friends and family, North Church. God does show us a little bit of heaven here on earth. Don't get me wrong, I know that there's going to be a lot of trials in the future. But we have Christ now. We'll make it. Yeah. Any, anything is possible with Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Oh, you're good. You just put it over there. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for sharing. That takes so much courage and boldness to share your story. Uh, and it's still so fresh. And uh, they, yeah, like I said earlier, they got baptized this morning of just saying yes to Jesus. You have made us a new creation and we want to follow you with everything within us. Uh, I believe that God is with us and he is at work within our church. And we are seeing people say yes to Jesus week after week. And we are in our 23rd year at North Church, but I believe we are just getting started. And let's all believe for God to do miracles, for him to do the impossible, that he hears us, he responds to our prayers, and he wants to pour out his spirit on us and do fresh and powerful things. And I think God wants us to remember, after all that we walked through in Joshua, to be strong and courageous and serve him only. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you that you are here. I thank you for your presence and for your goodness. I thank you that you change lives every single day. It's not just something in the Bible and the Old Testament where you did miracles and you worked wonders and you turned uh, people around, but you are doing that today. You are doing that here and now. And God, we thank you that you go before us. Lord, would you teach us, would you help us, show us what it means to put you first. Show us where there is sin that you want us to repent of. Show us where uh, we feel lost and where we need to turn that to you. Holy Spirit, we believe in your power and your glory and your goodness. Paul and Tammy are a living testimony of that, that you are still alive and you are still at work. So we thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.